Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about all 12 maps in ARK Survival Evolved. Now ARK has been out for quite a long time, and they've released 12 maps in total, and historically whenever a new map gets released, typically that will be a fan favorite for a period of time because it brings something new and something fresh, or it improves upon what was already in ARK. Now once that initial feeling fades though, the real question is, is do those maps hold up to the test of time? Now recently I asked this question to my community and viewers and subscribers, and they basically voted and said what they believed was the best map in Ark Survival Evolved. And coming in at number one, they said that Ragnarok is the very best map, followed closely by Aberration and Fjordor. Now, the very last map, just to kind of put a opposite spin on that, is they said the Center and Scorched Earth are two of the worst maps. Now, today, I'm going to tell you what I think is the best map, and I will be doing that by going over each map in detail. So now, starting off here in at number 12, I must say that I actually agree with my subscribers on this, and that I believe the Center should be placed in at number 12. Now, I do believe a large portion of this is partially due to its age, being the fact that it was the first map that was released initially after the island, Essentially, it does have just the island's creatures, actually minus seven creatures to be exact, and it does just have the one boss arena with two reused bosses from the island. Now, the center is not all bad, so the center has a lot of great features that are definitely worth looking at. You know, the floating island, the underground biome, and, you know, there's just a lot of great base locations as well. It is a very pretty map, and it has plenty of resources. So if you were starting out in a new playthrough, and you wanted somewhere that was pretty easy and laid back or relaxed... 100% the center is a great map, but if you are looking for a map that has challenge, a map that has diversity, a map that's like a true arc experience, I would say the center is probably not that. Again, it's not a bad map, it just has a lot of older aesthetics, and just the diversity is pretty low, so that is why I place it here in at number 12. Now, coming in at number 11, my subscribers said Scorched Earth, and again, I think I have to agree with you. And I, I will say, though, Scorched Earth is not a bad map. I think it's actually a much better map than the center. But the only problem is, I believe, is the biggest concern is the lack of content. You see, Scorched Earth only has three maps. And I'm not going to consider the fact that the story is not complete, because at this point in time, now that we're reflecting on these things, you know, years later, the story is complete. So my biggest concern is that it is a story map, you know, and there is just the three caves. So... You go there in the best part of Scorched Earth, hands down, one of the very best things in ARK is the early game. Any survival world, you know, before you get a whole bunch of stuff, that early game is the pinnacle of some of the best content and memories you will have. And Scorched Earth truly does a fantastic job of offering that with the challenge of water and the challenge of difficulty just finding resources in general. Metal is significantly more difficult to find on Scorched Earth than it is on maps like the island or the center. And so for that, I do believe it offers a fantastic challenge, especially if you've just come off the island or the center, in regards to, you know, the early game. But once you do start acquiring tames and breeding up and then doing the caves, it loses a lot of that replayability, because you're just doing the same things over and over. And it's not even like the caves are difficult, like the caves you encounter on Aberration. The caves are actually pretty straightforward, they're very wide, and you can actually honestly avoid a lot of the encounters in the caves themselves. So I do think that there is a lack of challenge there and the content once you get past that early game. And that is why it's landed its spot in at number 11. Now, move on over to number 10 here. I actually have something different than my viewers and subscribers. They said Gen Part 1 was here, and I believe that Extinction should be here. Now, my opinion, of course, but the reason for that is that I believe the Extinction map is probably the least approachable map for somebody that is new to ARK. And even if you are not new to ARK, Simply, the idea of going to just play on Extinction just to do a fun new playthrough is typically not what you would think. Usually, you go to Extinction after you've already been on another map, and more often than not, you will usually bring over tames from other areas. Now, if you truly just want that Extinction experience, or again, you're trying to take on the, you know, the Alpha Titan or the King Titan, then 100% you're going to go there and see the toughest boss you know you could fight in the game. Uh, obviously, Gen 1, I guess, could be quite hard too, but... Uh, yeah, it's just, it's really, it's not something you would just start a fresh playthrough through more often than not. That's not to say that it can't happen. Now, in regards to the biomes that it offers, they are very unique, and the orbital supply drops are such a great thing that they added to the game. It basically was like they had taken what the caves were, and they went through and they created a new form of challenge in these supply drops, and having these different corrupted creatures and unique creatures, which is also what was introduced in Extinction, was really, really great. 
you know, having those different corrupted creatures with the supply drops, being able to mutate and breed creatures up for it, and defending them gave you a whole new thing to go through and do. And I think that is the pinnacle of what Extinction is, is easily those supply drops. But just having just a couple of caves and then dungeons and then just those large bosses and then not being very approachable to everyone, if I was to ask you, every single one of you, if you have played Extinction and if you have beat it, or more often than not, if you just do it for a period of time and then transfer off or start somewhere else, I doubt there is a high percentage of people who have actually finished the Extinction map. I can tell you, I personally have not beat it on Alpha Difficulty in the single player. And that is why it has landed here in at number 10. All right, moving on over here for number nine. So at least my subscribers had Extinction and Gen Part 1, and now I have Gen Part 1 in at number nine. So essentially, I just flip-flopped the two. Now, when Gen Part 1 first came out, I, I loved the map. It was so much fun. I spawned in the swamp area because I said it was easy. I proceeded to die 10 times in about 10 minutes to basically everything, berries, capros, all the fun stuff. And then I decided to go live in the snow for the first time ever in Ark, and I had an absolute blast. Even though there was an ex Tyrannus who decided to try and kill me every couple of days, it was still a pleasant experience. I really, really liked it. And partially because when I had first tried playing, I had played on official settings, and getting to the end game was a challenge. This is before I sat there and knew that, you know, constantly adjusting your settings to your preference and your time play style is really the best way to enjoy ARC. Don't make it harder on yourself than it needs to be if you're just playing in a single-player world. But being able to join in a game in Genesis Part 1 and having access to some of those really high-end, you know, loot drops, getting element and, you know, different tech stuff really early on, you don't even need to get to the late game to be able to access it. So if there's somebody new to ARC or somebody who can just never progress fast enough and they get bored because they don't have access to some of the really, really good gear, I would highly recommend Gen Part 1. It's not a true ARC experience, but I'd recommend it because it gives you that ability to basically get exposed to those things if you've already spent so much time in the game and never had the ability to do that. Or if you simply just want to grind up really good loot and you're going to go through and, you, like, let's say, use your grinder because you want to stock up on metal or different resources, you can take all those drops you get from the missions and go through and grind them up. And now let's talk about the bad part and the good part, and that is the missions. There is some of the most content in Generation Part 1 because there are over 100 and I think 70 some missions. And that is absolutely insane. But then the question is, is are all of those missions truly accessible to every single player? And the answer to that is no. Playing in an area like a single player world, for example, a lot of those missions are very, very difficult. In a single player world, even if you do all the breeding and have significantly stronger creatures than what you typically would, you could still lose a lot of those fights. And even in playing in multiplayer or groups of three to four, if you don't really, really prepare, there is a good chance you will lose a lot of those missions. They are extremely, extremely challenging. And so you've probably seen lots of even the most popular ARC YouTubers or different people who have thousands and thousands of hours will probably tell you that the missions are either impossible or just not worth the time because of how challenging they are. I think it was a great idea and the shop was kind of cool, but it definitely is not the traditional caving experience that you get in ARC, and it can certainly be a deterring factor for a lot of different players. So that is why I place it here in at number nine. And lastly, I want to talk about the building. In single player, that doesn't really matter because you can build wherever you want. You can literally build on a mission. I lived on the ice pond for a long time, and uh, it, was a, it was a great place. But if you're playing on a server, there's a large part of the map that is just not usable because there is basically nowhere that you're allowed to build. All right, well, let's move on over to the next one here, which will actually be Gen Part 2. All right, and now in Gen Part 2 here, I think the biggest problem I have with Gen Part 2 is actually the sheer size of the map. The map is enormous, and usually you would think that a big map meant there is so much more to do. And it's actually the quite opposite. It is one of the largest, if not the largest map, I think Fjordr might have it beat. And uh, I just, I don't think there's a lot of content there. If you were to set up a really nice space and be close to somewhere like a mission terminal, and you know, the moment you start to get into the mid game where you have a lot of your resource dinos or the majority of the teams that you want, you really don't have an incentive to go out to explore the rest of the map. Now, yes, you can go through and look for like the different explorer notes. Yes, you do have to travel to the space area in the middle to go through and collect vital resources at certain periods of time. And yes, of course, you will visit the Rockwell area. But everywhere else on the map above ground, there is not a lot of incentive to go there once you have just got the tames. So, for example, on the island, you know, there's 10 different caves. You can't Constantly have an incentive to go to different portions of the map to make those return trips. Now, I do understand that on a map as big as Genesis, 
having to constantly go back to certain areas could certainly be tedious. So I could see the concern uh, or the determinant there, but I just feel like a lot of the map is not used to its fullest potential. It's a beautiful map and there's an amazing amount of places to go through and build, but I just feel like it's kind of empty in regards to the quality of what's actually available to you. Then in regards to the missions, I think the missions in Gen 2 are a huge step up from the missions in Gen 1. I think not being out in the open and just having the missions be a lot more approachable and honestly, there's some of them are just really, really fun. Uh, I think it definitely takes a step up there and it's a great job, but I don't think it is the pinnacle of arc, which is why I do have it placed here in at number nine or number eight. All right, now moving on over to number seven here. My viewers said they had Lost Island. I actually have Val Guerrero. Now, if I was to ask you what it is that you like about Val Guerrero, I bet you 99% of your responses are probably the Danonicus. That creature is just an absolute blast to play. You know, they can glide, they can climb, they deal bleed damage, they have amazing colors and they have the ability you know with the eggs to basically give you that adrenaline type feeling when stealing the eggs not quite to the extent that wyverns do because obviously can't breathe you know fire or lightning or poison but uh, it's still a lot of fun to tame them breed them and use them now looking at other things outside of the creature though the map itself is extremely unique it has different biomes all throughout there's an underground aberrant area and there's also the first roaming boss that was actually released in Ark with the Broodmother roaming around in its specific area. All of these things are great and definitely make it stand out. But if it did not have the Danonicus, the question is, would people still go here to this map? Yes, the underground ocean or the ocean that runs through the map is unique, but would it be enough to keep you there? And honestly, uh, I've played through it a couple of times and I got burned out. A lot of the artifacts are fairly straightforward to go through and get, and there's just not that much challenge. And you could go into the Aberrant area or the Wyvern Trench to retrieve those, but things like the Aberrant area basically allow a lot of the more potent uh, or stronger tames that you would typically visit in Aberrant Area 4. And at that point, you know, you might as well just go to Aberration to get things like the Rock Drake or the Reaper, or even Gen Part 2, you know, for things like the Reaper. I do think Val is great, uh, and it definitely stands out. I personally, I have a love-hate relationship with the ocean. I love that it runs down the middle of the map. It's super cool, and definitely adds some uniqueness to it. Uh, as many times as those jellyfish would sing me in the river, I really enjoyed it. In regards to the underground area, the fact that I would be underwater and underground, and if I did go through and was drowning or had no way to get down there, uh, I hated every single part of that, but that's probably just me. Uh, I think Gen 2 did it slightly better but uh yeah that is why i have it placed here in at number seven so moving on over to number six i have the island now this is probably i would say one of the higher rankings for the island if you've watched a lot of other ranking videos and it's not for nostalgia, to be honest. Um, I think that there's a really important thing we need to talk about, and that is the quality of content. So think about it. The island is the smallest map in Ark. And not only is it the smallest, but it has some of the most content in Ark. You have all these other super large maps, but the island is the smallest with 10 different caves, and then the 11th cave with the tech cave, the true pinnacle of a challenge, to go through and to ascend. Now, what I think holds the island back for sure is the fact that it has been out for so long, so it lacks a lot of those aesthetic and quality of life features that other maps have. And of course, it does get a bit boring, and I'm sure you've probably built a base in every location imaginable. And also, there is the lack of diversity in creatures, and that, of course, can get extremely boring. Now, I do think come Ark Survival Ascendant, which we will not talk about at this time, but I think with Ark Survival Ascendant, if people were to make a new ranking video here in the future, or when I go to do one, I would assume the island will still be or would be higher up for the simple fact that there are now mods and a lot of creatures have been added officially to the base game, basically adding more replayability. And of course, the reworked locations, I think definitely give it a fresh look and maybe a new perspective for some people. But that is why I have it placed in here at number six. And then coming in at number five, I have Crystal Isles. Now, when I first spawned in on Crystal Isles, it was absolutely breathtaking. Let me tell you, it is one of the, if not the best looking maps in Ark Survival Evolved. I know there are a few others that could be potential contenders, but the map is, it's awesome. It looks amazing. That means it had a plethora of fantastic base locations. There are so many really cool places to build here, whether it be floating in the islands or outstretched over lagoon or in the desert. And then it brought things like the Griffin Trench, where Griffins previously were very difficult to obtain, and you may only find a few at a time on maps like Ragnarok. So that was awesome. Now, where it falls short, 100%, everyone's going to tell you, and that is the lack of a challenge and an end game. You can go through and you can build there. And if you have a cluster, it may be where you want to set up a central hub, but you're not going to probably spend all that much time there specifically playing the map. 
because yes, it does have all the great biomes. Yes, it has things like the Griffin Trench, and it has things like the Wolf Cave and the Saber Cave. So very specific proprietary things, but there is just no real caves and no real challenge. And so the, the fact that the artifacts are so easily accessible definitely makes it great for things like PvP. But in regards to PvE and the longevity of the content and the time that you will spend there, I think that's where it falls short. Now, I don't think that means it's a bad map, but I do think that it can make you question whether it's worth actually starting up there or not. Or if you want an easy map and you just want to kind of just relax, like I mentioned earlier in some of the previous maps, like the center, I would say Crystal Isles is probably the easiest map. Now, one last thing to note here is that it was the very first map to go through and introduce a unique boss in the non-story maps. And with that boss, came a unique arena. But I don't think that's enough to push it any higher. And I think, you know, it, it was well deserved for spot number five. All right, now coming in at number four. Now I know this is where a lot of controversy is gonna go through and start, and I'm probably gonna make a lot of people upset and mad. But this is simply just my opinion. Coming in at number four is Ragnarok. Now I think that Ragnarok is a great map. And when it was first released, that was the pinnacle of arc. It took everything that was repetitive and boring on things like the island or the center or scorched and it just upped the game it was a huge map with beautiful locations like the highland and the viking the pirates bay and the wyvern trenches it took everything and put it all into one map and i don't think there's any map even to the state that goes through and has a better location to farm things like Aegis and titans than the desert on Ragnarok. It is such a fun map to go through and play on. Now, and on top of that, they also have two sub-bosses. Now, those locations could be a bit buggy, and you could often die either during the fight, before, or after, but they were certainly there. Now, the reason I have it ranked in at number four is I personally, I hate the caves on Ragnarok. I, I absolutely cannot stand them. And it's not that they are more challenging than maps like the Ice Cave on the island, or you know, aberration caves. I just, I would mesh through the caves quite often and the caves are just, they're, they're bland. They're, there was no detail whatsoever. Now I understand that is probably its age that is just showing. That's not to say that in ASA, they don't just redo this thing and everything about this is glorious and shines and maybe I changed my mind. But in regards to just ASC, that is where I please it because I think there are other maps that just look better than it now have more diversity and more unique bosses. So that is why I place it in at number four and uh, let me know down in the comments if that was wrong to do that. I am sure a lot of people may think so. All right, coming in at number three, this is probably gonna be a shock to a lot of people. Now, number three is actually my favorite map in ARC. But for certain reasons, I cannot place it any higher. There is just something truly holding it back. And that map is the Lost Island. Now let's go through and talk about why I can't place it any higher first, the technical issues. The performance on Lost Island sucks. Let's just get that out of the way now. It is horrendous. I think that if I was to go through and boot up Minecraft and hold them side by side in a populated area, I would probably have a less pixelated image and have it look clearer and nicer in Minecraft that I would on the Lost Island. Now, that is not to say that is how it always is, but in dense areas like the jungle, and because they added absolutely so much detail into it, when you're a leader into the game and you are breeding creatures, or you have a lot of different things going on, you go over and you look at your dinosaurs, or even yourself in a third person, and your face and everything just gets obscured. It is a face so ugly, even a mother probably could not love it. They would just leave you there like the wild baby dinos that we have in ASA. It's pretty rough, but bearing that performance issue, I really still believe it deserves to be in the top three. And first and foremost, one is the creature diversity. Now, I understand that's not quite fair because it was one of the last maps to go through and get released, but it does have more creatures than any other map with the exception of Fjordjur. I totally slaughtered that name. My bad. But uh, yeah, it's, its diversity is amazing. The fact that it has the desert with a lot of the desert creatures there, it's got the snow biome with the man, man in armor. I just, I can't with names today. My bad, guys. Let me know how bad I screwed those ones up. And uh, yeah, it just, there's so much creature diversity there. But on top of the creature diversity, the space that it has, it uses well. It is the first non-story map to have the closest experience to caving that traditional story maps gives you. It does what I think Ragnarok could have been. It has a great jumping puzzles, great caving. There's so many different caves here on it. And some of them can be a little bit more challenging. And at the very least, they are fun. It is exciting to go through and to go caving on this map. It is the first experience 
I felt on a non-story map that truly brought that back that reminded me of my original time playing through the island. And that is like the biggest reason that I rank it so high is because a lot of places fail to do that. When a new map comes out, you know, mystical maps are cool, new structures are cool, new creatures are cool. But at the end of the day, a lot of us just want to go caving. We want that traditional experience. And the Lost Island is the closest thing we have had to that. And so that is why I have it placed so high in at number three. And of course, we cannot not talk about these cinema craps. It is game changing. And so I think that just in general, this map is really good. Again, it introduced a unique boss and other unique creatures. But I, I think the map is great and definitely deserves this number three spot. All right, now coming in at number two, as there is only two maps left, I may get some people that disagree with me on this one as well. But I believe map number two is Aberration. Now, let me tell you why I placed it in at number two and not in at number one. And it's not actually anything that it specifically does wrong. It's just something that it lacks. And that is content. Aberration is just like every other non-story map. So I mentioned the size of maps and the content they offer. If you look at the island, it has 10 caves. Every other story map, so Scorched Earth, Aberration, and then Extinction, all have roughly three caves or dungeons to do. And that is the extent of it. And then you have the missions that are available in Gen 1 and Gen 2. That doesn't make it a bad map. It just means that there is less things to do. But that is the only fault that it has. Progression in Aberration is better than any other map 100%. Every single thing you do in Aberration, from the moment you take your first step, open your first explorer note, tame your very first creature, Upgrade your creature to a Steko so you're not getting jumped by Aberrant Raptors. Pick up your first gem. Build your first zipline. Every single moment of progression and aberration is rewarding and truly feels like you have value. You don't have to grind for hours to feel like you have any form of success in aberration. And I think that's why so many players love it. Because there is not a single moment where you feel like you're having to do something and it's boring. There is always something to go through and to do. So... I 100% believe it could be the best map if there was just more to it. That's not to take away from it, but because it's been out for so long, I think that's the only reason that it basically, for me, is not number one. All right, now coming in at number one, there is only one map that is left, and that is Fjordor. Now, this is not my favorite map, and I actually personally dislike this map. It is not my favorite. But I feel like it would be wrong of me to not place it at number one. For the simple fact is, there is so much content crammed into this map that is probably two or three other maps worth of content just in one. And now what I mean by that is, think about it. So one, there are runes that are on this map. There is not a single other non-story map that has a collectible like Explorer Notes that allow you to go through and increase your character's max level. This is the only non-story map that has that. So immediately, that gets a huge boost and an edge. Now on top of that, how you acquire those runes is typically through killing alphas, or you can find them. So not only do you hunt them down, but you actually get rewarded for going through and challenging some of the tougher creatures that you go through and encounter. Speaking of tougher creatures, the creatures on this map, there is a massive diversity. There are more creatures on this map than there are on any other map in Ark. Now, of course, that is due to the fact that it is the last map that was released for Ark Survival Evolved, but that can definitely not be failed to be looked at because it just gives you so many options on how you're going to go through and actually attempt or play your playthrough. And then on top of that, the bosses that you have, there are seven different bosses, four unique bosses. This map has so much to go through and do. And then there's all of the biomes, each unique, special, offering something that's different and challenging. But the one thing that I just absolutely cannot overlook that I personally do not like is the teleportation concept. They did it in Gen 1 and it was a struggle. And I understand why that it because that is part of the mythology and you are supposed to use this to teleport between the three areas. But in a single player world, having to constantly backtrack to go to one location, I hated it. I just personally did not like that factor. I wish they were more easily accessible. I 100% think the content that's there, and it is a big map that is packed full of things. It is not an empty map by any means whatsoever. 
So if anybody wants to go find a map to just go through and just play nonstop and literally just have an endless possibility of things to do, this is definitely it. The sheer amount of content this map has definitely deserves it the number one spot. All right, guys, I, it was a long list and it was a long video too. I am sure I probably upset some of you and some of you may agree. Let me know if you enjoyed the video and let me know in the comments what you think the correct order should be. And consider leaving a like and subscribing if you're not already.